Good evening. This is the Wine of Life podcast. I am Wes, and today we're going to talk about Southern Baptist polity. I asked a question on the last one last week about should the Southern Baptists change their polity, uh, basically change the ecclesiastical structure, or is it wrong, or is it being interpreted wrong? I think these are things we need to reflect on, given all of the uh, issues and lawsuits at hand. And so what I did was um, I listened to some people in the executive committee, and then I listened to some people who work for the seminaries who've written things about this at NAM. And so we're going to read something from a Dr. Stan Norman, who wrote a piece about um, Southern Baptist polity back in 2004. He is now the president at Williams Baptist University. We're going to listen to a clip as well from an executive committee member named Rod Martin, who spoke on a podcast, uh, the Founders Ministry podcast with Tom Askell, um, about what he says about Southern Baptist polity. And we'll also read some of the statements made by some of the executive committee members who voted against the uh, uh, waiving privilege in the investigation. Rod Martin also voted against it. But there were pastors... um, uh, pastors Holloway and Robertson from Louisiana also voted no. And I want to read what they say um, because the investigation itself is not something I really know much about or I, I know what's going to happen or anything like that. What I'm worried about is um, how we are structured and how we can stop these things from happening through church discipline in the first place so that if something happens when it gets uncovered, uh, the pastor who was in the wrong or the minister in the wrong or the person in the wrong can be disciplined, removed from the church to ensure that it doesn't happen again. Because one of the big things about a lot of this stuff is that stuff happened and then the pastor of that church who got in trouble will just move to another church and do the same thing. And then he'll get in trouble and then he'll move to another church. And so we have a big problem with that. And uh, But this is what the guy um, Holloway, Pastor Holloway from Louisiana says, um, He says these allegations, sexual abuse allegations, have not been brought up against the executive committee, but against SBC entities. The executive committee has consistently told survivors, and I think that's important that he says that, because he's not talking about people who are making allegations or things that will come up in the investigation itself. He is talking about sexual abuse survivors that the executive committee has already communicated with. He says, this is not our jurisdiction. You need to go to the seminary or church where you were hurt, They have their own insurance policy. They have their own board of trustees. The executive committee has not been able to do anything about it because that is not how we are structured. I believe that getting into the deep pockets of the cooperative program is where a lot of this is coming from. So what he's saying is is that the executive committee has no power over these other entities due to the autonomy that the entities possess. Now, uh, you know, I did the video about the Riley Foundation case and the idea of the sole member belonging to the SBC and that the SBC executive committee puts in trustees who actually do have a lot of power over the um, seminaries at least and the other entities but that's you know so there's kind of a contradiction there but nevertheless uh, I want to play you this clip by Rod Martin it's about a minute long from this podcast and he says something about SBC polity. So I want you to check that out. If these are honorable people, I haven't seen them do anything that would suggest anything of the sort. Take, for example, Mark Ballard, who was chairman of the bylaws working group uh, that was that was very briefly handling some of these issues before we went to the annual meeting in 2019 and created a an enhanced credentials committee to take that role over. Well, those guys deliberated. There were there were a bunch of people there, and the content of their discussions primarily centered on how do we create a permanent structure like our now existing credentials committee without violating Baptist church polity? Because we are a group of 47,000 independent churches. They don't have to comply with anything we say. Mm -hmm. We don't have subpoena power. We don't have any way to make them do anything. The only power we really have is to kick them out of the convention. So how do we square what we're being asked to do 
with what we're capable of doing. Okay. So what he's saying there is that uh, people within the SBC or messengers, whoever, uh, want there to be some sort of committee that then uh, can remove pa uh, pastors or ministers or people in churches um, due to uh, the things that they've done, sexual abuse and so on. And he's saying that they don't. The, the executive committee really has no authority because there is no ecclesiastical body that has that sort of authority. There's nobody who can tell any one of the 47,000 churches you can't have this guy's pastor or, or, or you, you need to remove this guy or so on and so forth. And uh, he goes on to say later on that, you know, we're not Presbyterians who have a body of Presbyters who make, can make decisions over the congregation, or we're not Catholics who have bishops uh, that can that can remove priests from their um, from their position, but uh, when we look at Southern Baptist polity, does autonomy mean that we are genuinely isolated and no one has any authority from outside the congregation to tell anybody from another congregation uh, what they ought to do with regards to um, the spiritual standards that we have in the Word of God? Uh, that is the, the ultimate question, is how we start to determine, how we define what autonomy means and what authority means and where we derive authority from in the first place. Um, so I'm going to read to you from this piece from Stan Norman. He wrote this. It's a position paper presented to the North American Mission Board in 2004. Uh, like I said, Mr. Norman, or Dr. Norman, is now the president of Williams Baptist but at the time, he worked at, um, he was the director of Bab at the Baptist Center for Theology and Ministry at the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. And so he did um, a, whole, a, a whole paper, it's uh, it saw 30 odd pages, 34 pages or so, about Southern Baptist polity and about how the Southern Baptist Church is supposed to work. So when you plant a church, you'll know how it's supposed to work. And so he uses people from uh, way back when. 17th, 18th century, but he also uses modern people like Albert Muller. He uses da uh, Daniel Aiken, who still are in the SBC today. And he talks about authority. He talks about the lordship of Christ. He talks about many things, but I'm going to read some, to you some, some of the things of how he defines the church, how the Southern Baptist Convention defines the church, and he talks about the Baptist faith message of 2000, which anybody who's part of a Southern Baptist church has to adhere to. So uh, first we'll talk about the idea that there is a local church and a universal church and so we have both of those things existing and so there's this article uh, article 14 within the Baptist faith and message uh, statement that was uh, in from 2000 that's on cooperation it says Christ people should as occasion requires organize such associations and conventions as may best secure cooperation for the great objects of the kingdom of God such organizations have no authority over one another or over the churches. They are voluntary and advisory bodies designed to elicit, combine, and direct the energies of our people in the most effective manner. Members of the New Testament churches should cooperate with one another in caring for the missionary, educational, and benevolent ministries uh, for the extension of Christ's kingdom. Christ's unity in the New Testament sense is spiritual. Harmony and voluntary cooperation for common ends made by various groups of Christ's people uh, cooperation is desirable between the various Christian denominations when the end to be attained is itself justified and when such cooperation involves no violation of conscience or compromise of loyalty to Christ and his word as revealed in the New Testament. So cooperation is encouraged and it's something that they believe to be voluntary, but there is this idea of not just a local church but a universal church as well so that everything that we're doing, though we're doing it in the local church, it actually involves the universal church as such. And so even cooperation uh, from without our denomination is even encouraged in this if the ends are appropriate. That is, the end for us would be the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But later on, um, he starts discussing uh, church discipline and how church discipline ought to be handled because in this, le uh, in this uh, paper, there are three marks of what he believes what the Southern Baptist Convention has described as a true church. And one of those is the right teaching of the Word of God. The other is the right administration of the sacraments or the ordinances. And the other is what they call church purity. 
and church purity is it is uh, administered through church discipline to uh, in order for the bride of Christ to be spotless so Baptists uh, historically have sought to maintain a clear distinction between those that belong to Christ and those that belong to the world. Those desiring to join a Baptist church knew that their membership included accountability to the authority of that congregation. In addition, membership in a Baptist church required the voluntary submission of their beliefs and conduct to the judgment of the church. Baptists believed that the gospel message lost its integrity and power if the church did not remain distinct from the world. They also believed that church discipline was one means of preserving the integrity of the message and ministry of the local church. So if church discipline was not performed, the purity of the church was lost, which means you were not distinct from the world. Therefore, you were not considered a true church. Those, those three that I said before are the marks of a true church, and if you don't adhere to them, you are in fact not a true church, according to the statement made here by this Southern Baptist um, professor. So, <clears throat> as we move forward, he talks about the necessity of uh, regeneration. For somebody who's in a church, they, they need to be regenerated, they need to be saved. And then he moves on to congregational polity, and he defines it. And so he says congregational polity, and this is the idea that we don't have a three-tiered structure within the Baptist church, whereas, say, um, the Anglican church or uh, the Lutheran church, or even though it's a little bit different, the Catholic church, the Eastern Orthodox church have a three-tier, which is uh, a bishop, which is head. They have uh, presbyters, or the Catholics might say priests, uh, or, or preachers underneath them, and then you have deacons as part of their clergy, and uh, bishops are over certain areas. And this came out of, we see this even from the, uh, the earliest writers. Uh, we see Ignatius, uh, who wrote a letter at the very, very early part of the second century, uh, really putting forth this idea. Uh, the reason why we don't do it is because the term bishop and the term elder, or, or the term bishop and the term presbyter, by Paul is used interchangeably. And so we don't uh, have a bishop that rules over a whole particular uh, area and then priests or, or uh, preachers underneath them. We have preachers or a college of presbyters can rule over a church. So some have a single pastor and then he has staff. Some have a college of presbyters, which is just a group of people who have been ordained, who would be known as elders or overseers, and then they have deacons. So with us, we have a two-tiered system rather than a three-tiered system, and the people that rule over that are the congregation. They uh, vote in the pastor. They vote the um, deacons in, which we see in Acts 6 is how deacons were chosen in the first place. Uh, and we find the idea of the College of Presbyters uh, or College of Bishops, uh, multiple pastors within a church that rule over a church. We find that in Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. We find it in uh, Acts 20. Um, but we also find some uh, idea or a seed of what you would call the uh, bishop role as well, where uh, Titus is told he's given authority by Paul to ordain people in all of the towns of Asia there that he was in. So the Southern Baptists, Baptists in general, and a lot of Protestants don't have the three-tiered system. We have the two-tiered system, and the Baptists have a congregational polity, so they rule over us. Um, so congregational polity may be defined as the form of church governance in which final human authority rests with the local or particular congregation when it gathers for decision making. This means that decisions about membership, leadership, doctrine, worship, conduct, missions, finances, property, relationships, and the like are to be made by the gathered congregation except when such decisions have been delegated by the congregation to individual members or group of members. So even within this, the congregation themselves can give up authority to somebody who they view as, as being over them if they see the need for that. So the intention of congregational polity is that the congregation governs itself under the lordship of Christ and under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, under the delegated authority of pastors and deacons, but with no governing ecclesiastical body exerting authority over the church. All members participate in the decision-making process. The congregational polity of a church must embody a democratic process. 
be responsible to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and be guided by his authoritative word, the inerrant scripture. So that is the basis of how decisions are made within a Southern Baptist um, church. We have this congregational polity, and then they make decisions based on that. And we see that in the New Testament. We see some people who decide to bring in pastors, some people who decide to get rid of pastors. Um, we see uh, the voting of deacons. I mean, even in the early church, um, we see Clement of Rome writing his letter to the church of Corinth. They had removed all of their pastors because they were having a problem. And he wrote in and said, uh, you know, bring them back. Stop acting like this. But we move on to the idea of autonomy because this is the main question. Um, and I don't, I, you know, the, the question of this is actually... Uh, really more complicated than we would think. When we say that no one has authority over us as an ecclesiastical body, what does that necessarily mean? That is the main question that I think is being raised when the people of the executive committee say there's nothing we can do for over these 47,000 churches. Um, but I'm going to read what he has to say about autonomy. He says, The Baptist Faith and Message describes local churches as autonomous because this principle is believed to reflect the basic New Testament position on church government. Now, when you see, uh, read the end of Philippians 4, Paul says, some people did, some churches would not send me money. They didn't help me, but you sent me money. And he describes uh, the gift that they sent him money-wise as being a sacrifice unto God. And so we know that not all of the churches were in cooperation, even during the apostolic age where the apostles were still ministering. Uh, and we know that churches were not uh, under some total governing way. We know that liturgies were different. We know that people had different creeds for many, many hundreds of years after the church. So there is a basis for the idea of the autonomous church, not necessarily doctrinally, but in the way that they manifested themselves and the way that they uh, governed themselves. So the primary focus in Acts and the epistles is the local church. The Bible makes no references to any entity exerting authority above or beyond the local church, no instances of control over a local church by outside organizations or individuals is found. The, in, the apostles uh, made recommendations and gave advice, but exercised no real rulership or control. Now, I have to completely argue against that. That is biblically completely false. Um, the apostles not only did... Uh, exert control, and they gave much more than just advice. They actually made outright commands to the churches. So when we read um, later on, when we read in, uh, where is it, 2 Thessalonians, uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, there were commands that Paul gave, and he said, these are commands that must be adhered to. When we read about the uh, Council of Jerusalem, they made, they didn't make recommendations. Uh, if we read Acts 15, I think it's, uh, Acts 15.39, no, Acts 15.29, um, he says these are requirements, right? James made a final decision about what the Gentiles, how the Gentiles should behave. Should they uh, get circumcised and become Jewish or should they not? Uh, the letter that he wrote to them and the, and the uh, decision that the council came to were requirements. So that is authority, and that is something outside of the local church, and that's something that we also practice within the Southern Baptist uh, denomination. For instance, ordination, which is the uh, laying on of hands from the presbyters in order to uh, confer a gift of, or, of uh, authority within the church, is given to uh, a pastor. Uh, you know, I was ordained at Calvary Baptist Church, when I serve at Westerly Hills Baptist Church. When I went to Westerly Hills, I didn't get reordained. My ordination held. So when we read something like 1 Timothy 4.14, the gift was conferred upon him by a, by a group of presbyters that laid their hands on him. We have no other instance of where somebody else laid their hands on him. He was, you know, Timothy, he was ordained at that moment. The gift was conferred upon him. He had then authority. So I can go, and I, I've preached at other churches, uh, and the same thing with baptism. Uh, when we read something like Ephesians 4, where is it that we find it? In Ephesians 4, 4 through 5, the idea that there's one Lord, there's one baptism. When we go church to church, we don't get rebaptized. And some of these things even go across denominational lines, not just, um, not just in the Southern Baptist churches. So uh, 
the local church can make uh, can perform acts and make statements that actually are uh, universal. Because as I said before, there is a universal church and there is a local church. And so the local church works um, within the idea of the universal church. So what then can autonomy mean with regards to this? Because uh, who then gets to say who has authority or not? And that, that becomes a major, major problem when we have when we have really really bad behavior like i think most people would agree we have but i think this man uh here dr uh stan norman is completely wrong about the idea that the apostles did not show authority we also as i said before in titus 1 uh titus is given authority to ordain people in all of the towns there he was not a member of every single church he was given authority he was not an apostle. He was somebody who was ordained by an apostle, but he was not an apostle himself. He was, uh, you know, he'd be just like us. He was given authority to function within other churches. So I disagree with him uh, with regards to that. And I think the biblical witness is, is uh, on my side with regards to this. Uh, and I think also the biblical scriptures tell us that the apostles didn't just make recommendations. They made actual statements of authority. So autonomy then gets defined here. Autonomy means that each local church is self-governing. Each congregation makes its own decisions regarding all facets of church life, including personnel, fiscal, building grounds, and other matters. A local congregation may freely choose to seek counsel from other churches and denominational officials, but the membership is not required or bound to follow that advice. The decision of a local church is, does not require outside ratification or approval, and I'm gonna I'm gonna argue against that a little bit uh, in a moment. Um, autonomy also shapes the internal structures of a congregation. Churches may choose to organize themselves in structures such as pastors and deacons, pastor deacon committees, pastor deacon committee church councils. Some Baptist contends the congregational polity permits a plural elder led structure. Uh, in each of these cases, the internal structures are subject to the final authority of the congregation. Now we get to the whole point of why we have congregational polity, the goal. The ultimate goal of congregational polity is for each church to discern and follow the will of the Lord of the church. With this in mind, certain qualifications of congregational polity should preclude some of the abuses often associated with this form of church governance. First, this is important. First, congregational polity does not mean that the church votes on the will of God. The goal is to ascertain what the will of God is and then obey Him. Congregational polity ideally um, is to mature the believer as they corporately participate in the process. Second, congregational polity does not mean that the majority rules. While there may be a majority, if the vote is contrary to the will of God, the congregation walks in disobedience. Now here's the major problem with that statement. If the congregation is walking in disobedience, who can tell them that they're walking in disobedience? It would have to be someone from the outside. So when we're talking about autonomy, we need to understand that autonomy means it should mean for us, and this is why I asked the question, should Baptist polity change? It might be that Baptist polity should be reinterpreted rather, rather than actually being changed, but the idea of autonomous means that we don't have a hierarchical structure, that we are autonomous from having uh, an ecclesiastical body above us who tells us what to do and what not to do, what to do with our money, where our tithes go, and so on and so forth. But it does not mean that we are isolated from the other churches who are also under the Word of God because ultimately the authority is not found in the congregation. And, th and this he affirms this. The, the, the authority is found in Christ and in the revealed Word of God. We have to adhere to what the Word of God is. So the idea of saying, well, I know that this pastor uh, got in trouble at this other church. Uh, you know, he raped someone or he's, he's done such and such a thing. Well, according to the standard that Scripture gives for people who are supposed to be uh, pastors, that means that they're disqualified. And so just like with ordination or baptism, you do it once and then it's universal, the Baptist church should have the ability to strip people of their 
ministries. They should be able to strip people of their ordinations and remove them. And we have two instances where Paul gives the congregation the ability to even anathematize people. Um, so when we read in Galatians 1, we find that he gives authority. He's speaking to the congregation. He's not speaking to rulers. He's speaking to the congregation uh, in light of rulers misbehaving here with regards to false doctrine. He says, but even if we, speaking of he who is writing an apostle, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be a curse, that is anathema. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching a, uh, to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be a curse. So for false doctrine, you can anathematize someone in authority of you. Now for, uh, when we get to 1 Corinthians 16, there's another uh, way that we can anathematize uh, leaders. Now I'm not saying that's the ultimate goal, but in 1 Corinthians 16.22, he says, if anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. That is anathematize our Lord come, which is uh, generally what people say, Maranatha. That is people who display uh, a not loving God, right, which I think we would place in some of these behaviors like pedophilia and so on as being that. You can anathematize them. That's according to the scriptures. Now, that would not be just for the local congregation. That would have to be universal because uh, if, if a pastor has committed adultery or he's been stealing, uh, that means he's a lover of greed. If we read 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 8, they should be removed from their positions, and that should be, count, or be considered universal because we are connected to the head, which is Jesus Christ. We are of entire body. We are not to, to cut off parts of the body from the rest of it. And I think if we, if we look at it that our authority is the Scriptures and that we need to be held accountable to the Scriptures in all of our churches, then a lot of the issues that we've been having where pastors have been uh, performing some grievous sin and just going to another church, sometimes in the same county or the same state, committing the exact same grievous sin and then moving to another one, these sorts of things, if church discipline truly happened, and we actually adhere to what we claim to believe in the first place, uh, then I don't think we would have the, a lot of the issues that are coming up today. And it has to do with not um, adhering to the Scriptures. Now, there is issues about bringing up accusations against elders. And if you do that, First Timothy says that we need to make sure that there are two or three witnesses to that. But there can also be evidence to that as well. Um, not just in regards of two or three witnesses. For instance, if there's video evidence of a pastor with a, another woman, for instance, then that in and of itself would count as the witness, and that would be acceptable. But uh, we we do need to make sure these are legitimate claims, but that's why they need to be investigated. And in fairness, uh, a lot of the people of the executive committee said they, they, they weren't against an investigation. They were against uh, the waiving of privilege, uh, but I think this goes beyond that. This goes to how our actual church works and how we define our polity. I think if we just say that um, we have no authority to do anything, I mean, if what if people are hiring um, pastors who are homosexual or who uh, agree with uh, homosexual marriage? Are we just going to say, well, we have no authority, there's nothing we can do? Of course we're not. We're going to say that these aren't these aren't legitimate pastors. These are people who need to be stripped of their ministry, and they're not, they should not be allowed to serve in any other uh, Southern Baptist church. We should do that for all of it, though. Every single one of the requirements that are found in the Scriptures, we need to be held to that. And uh, if we do that, and we go back to a more biblical-based polity, rather than thinking about it from a legal perspective, saying legally we can't remove these things, the spiritual authority that we find in the Scriptures is much more authoritative and much more binding than anything, any laws uh, from any, you know, created nations that exist now. Um, the scriptures need to be the thing that we hearken to. And if we look in the scripture, we will find plenty of people who were removed from their office due to their sin. Um, so we find um, people like uh, Reuben, who was removed from being the firstborn because of his sexual sin with Bilhah. We find Moses. Moses did not die of old age. Moses died because of his public sin uh, 
when he struck the rock twice. Um, we find Eli. Eli did not get removed because of his own sin. He got removed because he covered up for the sins of his sons. He was removed. Um, we find later Abiathar was removed from the high priest, and that was in connection with Eli's sin. And so only the sons of Zadok are allowed to serve the Lord anymore within the Levitical priesthood. Um, we find, uh, and that, that's stated in uh, Ezekiel, was it 40, 46, I believe, or 41, 46, um, when the Lord returns and rebuilds the temple again. We find in uh, the New Testament, uh, Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot did not get replaced by Matthias because of his death. He got replaced because of his sin. Uh, if he did not die, he still would have been replaced. They would have brought somebody else in. Um, so we see that people in authority have been removed. Um, so I don't know why we can't uh, do the same thing. I know that there's like money involved. I know there's all sorts of friends and all that stuff and uh, the way that these things work, but if we, if we don't adhere to what the scriptures say, then I think we're going to find that judgment will come down on us much, much harder, much, much swifter than we're prepared for. Um, so that's my thoughts about when I ask the question about should we change our polity, it may just be that we should change the or look at the way that we interpret our polity. Uh, how are we defining autonomous? Because I, I don't see how Jesus would think that his body, which is the church, should function in this isolated capacity, that people should just do whatever they want um, well outside the bounds of scriptures. Um, I can't see how that's acceptable. And other people within the church going, well, that's okay. That they, we don't have any authority over them. We can't do anything. We have the scriptures, and the scriptures have authority over them. And so I don't, I don't know why... Other churches can't be involved when, as as the guy wrote himself with regards to church, planting churches, just because of the congregation rules on it, they could be walking in disobedience. Well, the only ones who could tell them they're walking in disobedience would have to be someone from the outside. That's the only way they'd be know they're walking in disobedience. And by the by the claims of people within the SBC, they claim that the mark of a true church is purity, which would mean that. If you don't have purity, then you're not really a true church. And so uh, how do we fix that? It has to be fixed from the outside because the authority of the scriptures binds all of us. It's not just that we decide to cooperate with regards to giving money. We are bound to each other, whether we want to be or not, by the scriptures. Uh, we are bound because Christ is our head. He is the word made flesh. So uh, that's something to think about. I want you guys to... To some people answered me back about the polity question. I think some people didn't quite understand what I was actually trying to say. I wasn't making a statement about the investigation because I don't know what's going to happen with that one. But I do want your uh, thoughts on this, how you think we should uh, define polity, not, not define, define autonomy. Uh, are we isolated, autonomous from all of each other, or are we just isolated from a hierarchical structure? There's a distinction there, and I think it's important to make that distinction. So let me know what you think, and I'll talk to you next time.